<laughs> right. Ah, sharing. Good. Uh, is that yes? Yeah, recording, which always helps. Another insane person has got up before sensible hours to come and join this collective, Mr. Chris Brindley. Welcome. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I'm I'm good. It's uh, another one of the collection. I have literally no idea how many I've done now, so perhaps someone can top them up and tell me. But um, <laughs> uh, it's been an interesting uh, time in the last sort of 24, 48 hours to hear a lot of new music and uh, very pleasant and exciting. Um, now, I know that you're one of the uh, illustrious vocal uh, composers com and writers that the Salvation Army is producing. And I know that I think one of your um, most famous was is I Have Seen the Glory of the Lord. Yes, uh, that's right. We'll, um, we'll um, crack on that in a little, but I, I always like to sort of go back to the beginnings of compositional history and sort of what's your background? Do you have a musical family or... Salvation Army credentials, if any, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I started playing the piano when I was um, just a little bit younger than five and never really cared too much for looking at what the dots were on the page. So I thought, well, I could do better than that, even though Beethoven usually knows what he's doing. So um, the, other, the other one is that um, it was just too hard. So I'd try to make up something that was easy that I could play. Um, but a little bit of experimentation started there and um, to be able to look at stuff is that it, uh, uh, what, what things sounded like when I was, at, when I was um, at, at the core and, oh, I like that piece, but I couldn't re exactly remember how it goes. So I'd fill in the rest of it. And um, from there, it, uh, it was uh, more than a few lessons in, in music theory through, um, through our um, Amy B exams that we have here in Australia. And uh, yeah, from, from there, it was a lot of trial and error but uh, a lot of people that were willing to give me a go and um yeah it was great great being able to try some things oh, so, yeah that's, that's, that's the beginning the very yeah. very beginning <laughs> so when do you most sort of remember the first time that a piece of music that you'd written or mucked around with was exposed to the world beyond the brindley family cocoon Yes, yes. Uh, most of the really early stuff was uh, was piano pieces. So um, there was one called Seascape. I don't think I've actually talked about this on a podcast, so you get the exclusive. Um, but uh, it was around the time I was uh, I was doing some uh, uh, doing I was at uh, the um, the Queensland Conservatorium of Music, and it was um, uh, that was that was the, the high school program. And I started mucking around with different time signatures and seeing what fit. And uh, some of these started, started to come together as a piece that actually kind of made sense. So I thought, okay, well, what's the story we're trying to tell here? And um, I think that's what has been something that gels all of the stuff I've done together. Um, uh, Barry Gott was, was uh, looking over one of my pieces once because uh, I've, I've played in his bands before. He was band master at the, at the call uh, that I was at twice. And uh, he says, what are you trying to say? I thought, that's, that's, that's really good. That's really clever. So um, that's pretty much what I've carried with me. It's, uh, it's looking at what, what, what it's trying to say. So with Seascape, it was, um, it was the quiet. It was the rocking of the boat. There was the storm. So you get um, uh, crazy backwards and forwards sound, sounding time signatures. Uh, and then it, uh, then it settled down into a beautiful sunrise. So, um, yeah, it's, it's trying to tell a story with everything. Uh, that's interesting. So, you know, from a very early age, you were, it sounds like you were very keen to experiment and just to learn in your own way and just to try and explore what music was, because it's not just, you know, the hymn tunes that we know and love, but it's how can you manipulate the hymn tunes and, you know, mm. did, did you get a feeling that, um, you know, because primarily you're, I, from the information I can read, you're primarily a vocal composer within the, the published world um, yes. that's not to say that you haven't done brass it's just so that hasn't flourished on the um salvation army spectrum as it were but 
I, is it something you're 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 um, able to do and happy to do, or is it you prefer the the vocal side of things? Um, I actually don't mind what type of group I write for. So it's um, I, I love vocal, and I've had the uh, had the Brisbane City Temple Songsters for fifteen years. So that was uh, <laughs> had a a lovely series of willing victims in front of me, and uh, and they 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 know all, a lot of my tricks. But um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to write for brass. I'm it's, I, I usually have less of an opportunity to do so unless it's an arrangement. And I usually like to do original works because it's, it's more, um, more of being able to tell that actual story, but um, uh, it's also a little bit harder to get published for brass as well. Um, I write for non-standard groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for the, for the main, uh, main type of brass band pieces, um, I've uh, done quite a few arrangements that we did for, uh, for we've done for trips. Um, we do a lot of uh, we play out in the, the city malls and parks, mm -hmm. and uh, we do some uh, all I do some pop sounding pieces so in uh, modern genres. Um, there's a couple of writers around in, in Brisbane where I'm I'm, I'm from, uh, Sam Kramer, Jared Prolix, and uh, Michael Cooper, all fine writers, and we always try to bring something oh, that industry. really. <laughs> Hey, um, but the, there's always something we try to bring to the table that uh, the public will just say, hey, that's really cool. So, um, yeah, so it might be a, a jazz piece. I did do an arrangement of uh, Lord, You Know That We Love You uh, in, a, in a big band style and um, Howard Davies did, get, uh, did uh, hear about that because I asked his, his thoughts and comments. And I did assure him that I did respect the lyrics, and it mm -hmm. did uh, it, it, it did um, do some, do the song justice. But uh, yeah, he's um, he was very gracious with his comments. So <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's the composer's um, way that you you can have the inspiration to say I want to try and tweak that, but at the same time you want to, you know, knowing that it has the respect and love of you know the Salvationist musicians. That you know, you don't just take. I'm going to take that. You know, when the glory and just the fun, and I don't care what happens. The last and original, but you, yeah. you go the extra and say, look, I've had this idea. You know, you wrote the original. I don't. I'm not trying to distract from that. I'm not trying to sort of manipulate that and just say, oh, the original was rubbish. In anything, you're trying to embellish it and say, hey, I love this piece so much mm. that you want to kind of update and say, would you mind if I tweak it a bit? I'm really not trying to offend you by doing this. So, um, yeah. yeah, so when you started out, well, I mean, were you, are you a pen and paper man? Or were you, is that a case of you started out with pen and paper then and now you just, you know, is it straight to the laptop and Siberia's finale, enter software name here kind of thing? How's the process? Yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't so sophisticated that I was pen and paper. I was pencil and paper. Mm. <laughs> Even better, give it's, it's, it's a big time. It's like, you, you know, you're going to make mistakes. So that's, that's where we go. But uh, yeah, it was, it was certainly pencil and paper and a, and a cheap little bit of manuscript. And uh, from there, I started using it as just to catch ideas as they came up. Um, I graduated to uh, cassette, you know, cassette recorders. Um, so I could uh, catch ideas and be able to take them down because uh, a lot of the work has um, started in, in improvisation. Um, I, I, saw a, I saw a clip on um, Alan Menken once when he was writing uh, the Disney music. And um, he's... Uh, he's you're sitting there with a tape recorder. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, that didn't work. That didn't work. Oh, hang on. That worked. I'll keep that one. So that was, that was a little bit of the process. And, um, and I started learning about overdubbing and things like that as well. So being able to um, make my own recordings. But um, yeah, it was, it's kind of a fun experience being able to see what you can get down on paper. But um, from from many composers greater than I, if I've certainly had the, the the experience where the ideas can come too quickly, it's just like oh, I, I'm not going to remember that bit. So um, yeah, the being able to sit down with some technology audio, is helpful. Yeah, there, there's a lot of mobile phone recordings now, and <laughs> yeah, um, I don't like to write no, to to go straight into Sovereilius, but um, yeah, Sovereilius is my tool of choice, and uh, Propellerhead's reason for um, synth rendering. So, um. How important do you make sure? Because I, I remember listening to, um, I, I think it was, I've seen the glory of the Lord. It could have been another one of the pieces. And the first sort of three or four introductory bars sounded very much like a, a, a group, uh, a, an Irish group I love called The Cause. And oh, yes. it's almost similar. And I thought, 
I know what this guy's been listening to. And then the, obviously the song goes off on a completely different tangent, but you had that kind of lovely mellow sound that goes in. But as a composer, obviously you're writing it, you're, you're, you're feeling a need and you're not trying to, you know, du accidentally duplicate the great writers out there and the local jingle for the weather station that will, oh, hang on a minute, I know what you've been listening to. Um, how do you sort of keep original or strive for originality when you're composing? Uh, through much sweat and pain. What's the what's saying that uh, good, uh, good arrangers borrow, great arrangers steal? Um, no, it's, it's something I live in constant paranoia of. So if, if there is something that's starting to sound like it, um, especially if you're trying to overwork an idea, it'll eventually morph into something that already exists. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I will rarely write something in, in less than a week. Um, mainly because I, I, well, it's nice not to rush it, but um, if you are doing that, you can get stuck quite quickly and um, to give it some time to rest and to be able to, to mull over it, then that's really helpful. So I've seen the glory of the Lord. That was 2016. I actually finished writing that. Um, it would have been about a year, a year or so that I'd, I'd spent on, on, on that because um, that was quite a journey that piece. Just, uh, I think I sent some notes out to, to give some background, but um, a lot of that was based more in the, in the study and uh, having that um, the, the three different scenarios that we're trying to, trying to depict. So mm -hmm. yeah, trying to, trying to be true to the text and make sure it doesn't copy anybody else. <laughs> I think there's a bit in there that does sound like another piece, but I'm, I'm, I'll not never mention that, so nobody gets the idea. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, who are the people that you would say were significantly important to you as a composer when you're learning your trade and learning your skills? And you know, it's not just the big names, the, you know, the Bill Himes, the Barry Gotts, you know, the Brian Hoggs. It's the school teacher. It's the YP band leader. It's you know your great aunt Maud who would sit around on a Sunday lunchtime and go, hmm, that's interesting. So who are the names for you that are important in your, that you would say, you know, in your autobiography, these are the, these are the musical mentors that helped guide and coach you? I, I, I will use, use one, one, big, uh, one big name and uh, particularly when I was, uh, not just a songster, but um, when I was singing in songsters, um, Len Ballantyne, to, to see what he's, he's done with that, uh, with, with um, the way that music has been shaped in the army and be able to, to progress it and move it in, in a way that's more than just four part harmony, um, as foundational and as beautiful as that is. And that's, that is such an art form, like you, you, you can't disbark. <laughs> um, so to, to see the, um, the, the new, uh, new spaces that he's taken into, that, that was great. Um, but a, a lot of it was um, was also outside influence as well. So um, I played quite a bit in the, in wind orchestras and so wind bands, and um, there's some great writers in there and some slightly insane ones as well. So whether it's uh, Percy Grange or, or or David Holsing or, or James Swearingen or any, anyone like that, um, it's just growing up in and and being aware of some of those those great um, great uh, pedagogical writers ones that like this this is how you write for a, a grade eight school band and it still sounds good like how, how does that work you pull it apart well what what does that sound like um so yeah it's it's being able to do that and then deconstruct some of the bigger writers so uh i'm a, a shostakovich nut so i i i love um, yeah. something as fiery like that and uh and to look at what he's done there or or some prokofiev stuff where he's um doing some some crazy jumping all over the place with with uh, neoclassicism all that sort of big classical stuff but um there's there's so many different different sources you can draw on um yep. even more recently um how people work with with um with synths and and backgrounds like what um carrie joe has, has been doing with a, a lot of, of her stuff um what what does that timbre sound like? How, what what's that tone color? How does that work? How does that not sound boring when you translate it into a mm -hmm. a, a brass band or or, or um, use a vocal uh, vocal percussion or accompaniment? Yeah. So yeah, just listening to the world that's around and being fascinated by it. So obviously, uh, you, you get um, people come and ask you to write for 
groups, ensembles. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Do you have a Melbourne staff song? So that I can't remember. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, Melbourne and Sydney staff. Yeah. So um, you have, you know, you have an idea of, you know, can you please write something for the upcoming Congress or summer season? And you know the constraints you're writing under. But when you're not doing a commission, when you're just writing and something's coming at yourself after walking the dogs, do you kind? Of, you know, is it the local core band, your local songs brigade that you kind of fix in your mind? Or is it just kind of let's go with it and see how it flows? Um, not, not, well, it's a little, little bit of both. So when I'll be, um, I know I have the group that I have in front of me or I'm playing in. So I know the constraints of it. I know what can be done. And you kind of highlight people that are in that and uh, think, okay, well, I know my sopranos can only sing up to a G. So that's, that's going to be something that's a, it's, it's a, 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 a a uh, feature of that piece, but um, in other cases, it's um, I wonder what this does, mm-hmm. and uh, and you write for uh, it, it's not a, not necessarily a generic group, but um, a, a piece that I'm um, I'm working with uh, Rob Little on a lyricist um, in in the UK. Um, I had I was, I was working with a piece bef- uh, working with the concept before of what if the whole first verse was only three notes and a chord. And just trying to do the, the mess to make it actually sound good. So sometimes it's more of a, I want to design a piece and see where it goes from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other cases, it might be something where I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, well, this would actually sound really good if we had um, the, the songs that's accompanied by the band. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I've done quite a few of those pieces, actually. Um, and I was at uh, 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 Sydney Music Camp last year and we did um, Speechless from Aladdin. So we had the vocal stream and I had, I had the, the brass band then. And um, to, to see the kids get, get into it and to tie that up with the, um, uh, the book of Ezekiel and uh, oh, no, book of Esther, sorry, and mm-hmm. see what that says. And it's like, okay, this actually ties really well because Esther was pretty much Princess Jasmine in Aladdin. So <laughs> looking at how the story can be told in each can be, can be pretty cool. That's interesting. I, it's always intrigues me to ask composers that kind of question because if you're not writing for a commission and you've got an idea that's buried and it's got to come out, the sky's the limit. And as a composer, you, you're aware that you have to have a structure to the piece and you can write this most fantastical, wonderful, evocative song where there's no limits and you can add and add and add and add and add. But like any good painter, you've got to sort of pull yourself to a stop and say okay I need to bring this down to a control you know it can be for the biggest choir a mass band a mass songsters but at the end of the day it's kind of where do I want this piece to go because you could you're very harmonious at doing the big star songster piece but that's only going to be used further by them whereas you know if you're writing for a small ensemble it's going to be used more frequently so yeah, yeah. Th- th- how do you control the, the creative impulse? Because being creative and having that juice and having that go and the Lord saying, come on, I want this done. But to control the, the fireworks, if you like, to keep it within a, a framework that you're happy with, without it going off on a strand and just sort of being overblown and out of context. How, how would you cope with the structure of that? Um it's sort of a natural selection process almost because I think if, if I ever set out to write for this big, amazing group that can do all things, um, I'd never finish it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's that simple. So it's like, oh, okay, yes, yes. And I'm, I'm running for a 150 piece orchestra and a 400 voice choir. And it's like, okay, so and you get, you get, you get lost in, in, in thinking about it that way rather than going back to the basics. Um, it just wasn't, uh, I was talking with Noel Jones the other day and uh, it's like simple, simple is very good. And that's, that's what he's, uh, and he's brilliant. Mm. It, it, it's some of the small stuff, which is actually really hard, but it works and it can and work with any group. Um, and most of the pieces I've written, including I've seen the glory of the Lord, you can sing with four singers. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 yeah. if you can reduce it down to that, um, uh, I did a, 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 a gospel piece, uh, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds complicated, but it's really, again, only four note chords. It's just got some uh, extensions in there. And 
if it can't be done simply, then it probably is going to be really, really hard, or it's going to be one of these one-off things that you get to say, oh, okay, that was a really good investment of 300 hours of writing for that three minute piece. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so you kind of, kind of weigh it up, but yeah, yeah it's, it's more yeah, the, yeah. is it going to, is it going to work for people? So uh, you, I mean, you say you have a, a summer to go to your local guinea pig. So, you know, are they, are they a good critic for you? Cause obviously, you know, until you, you know, the music on the, the stand is, there to be sung and there to be performed whereas it's only just been on head on your computer where it's pitch perfect and everything's harmonically correct until the vocals get it and they're going what the heck you call this so <laughs> are you a good are you a good receiver of criticism is it a, something you enjoy you know because it benefits you or are you kind of you know have to go off and hold your smile which person um... is good for you Oh, oh um, I, I have a very uh, gracious um, local core who's willing to try things. So um, I, I have I have tried things with, with um, the, the band, the songsters, the worship team and uh, the singing company. Uh, and I was YP Bandmaster for a while, though, so the kids got subjected to it. Fortunately, younger kids don't know any better. <laughs> but, um, it's It's been good that, that they've been willing um, and I, I, I think like many people are my own worst critics. So I'll listen to something and think, and I'll be dying on the inside, but they'll say, oh, that was okay. And it's like, that was very nice of you to say that, but I'll go away and cry for a little while and then completely rewrite it and come back. Um, I did an arrangement of uh, the prayer um, and that was, uh, I think I got to version four before I even put it in front of the, in front of the band. And uh I'm so glad that no one remembers that read because it was horrendous. But I, I put it away for a couple of a couple of months, and I um, uh, I eventually had to, I had an opportunity to write uh, do that arrangement for a local symphony orchestra um, for for a rather large concert, and uh, redid it re and completed it properly, uh, and that worked really well. So I reduced it back down to brass band, and I think that ended up going to 13 or 14 different countries. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it's, it's, it, it's that evolution of being able to give yourself time to fail, I think is, is helpful, but a little bit painful. When was the first time that you can, if you can remember, what was the first time you remember? Cause it may not be the first time, but the first time you remember being asked and saying, you wrote it, you conduct it. Uh, that may have been the, may have been the first, um, uh, I, I mean, think YP you, band was probably one of the easiest. Your YP bands and your sing companies and your songs, and you do learn around, and they come and say, well, okay, you know, it's easy enough to give it to the songs leader and bury yourself in the alto section or behind the trombone, but, you know, <laughs> come on, you wrote it, you know what it's all about, let's see you direct it and you bring it to life. Yeah, it might, might have been with the YP band and that was um that was trying to get a couple of the kids to shine with um because you, you've got some some natural high flyers and uh i had i had done a march and that was that was one of them i'm, I'm not, a, not a, i i love how wonderful uh marches are in training and and how, how good they can sound i just don't yeah know. <laughs> but i'll always use them if i if i'm if i'm start, if i'm conducting a, a brass band um but there were a couple of kids that um, that w were willing, and I thought, okay, well, this is this is something we're going to do, so so let's do it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 an adventure. It's an adventure, and there's, there's nothing quite like the terror of conducting your own pieces. <laughs> I've, I've never conducted a band, so I wouldn't. Uh, I've never conducted a Salvation Army group, so I wouldn't know. Um, not really a percussionist thing. Um, <laughs> you get two sticks, so you're twice as good. I'm only halfway I'm normally, there. I'm normally on the bass drum. I mean, I, my um, old bandmaster, retired bandmaster, was um, a national serviceman when he was training. And um, he basically done what all boys do in the Citadel bands, was he sat behind the drummers in the Citadel band and watched them like glue picked it up, then learnt a brass instrument to get into the band. Oh, yeah. uh, it was called up for national service. And when I joined the band, uh, he said, we're going to put you on drums. And we had one bass drum and one snare drum, one crash cymbal, 
and a single triangle and that was the percussion section and he said I, what i want you to learn is how to do it on the march because i want to do i wanted drum kit and to learn daniel and shine jesus shine and yeah, he, yeah yeah you need to learn how to march with the band and to, that's to this day why i cannot play a drum kit because I, <laughs> I can do bass i can do bass drum and i can do snare drum but i can't do it separately because i had to do it separately on the march and he said and to be honest that was wonderful training because it helps to keep the beat but um obviously in a compositional aspect the order of you writing them bears no relation to when they get published if they get published and that's very much a case of you're writing something when you're 15 years old and then two years later it's hang on a minute you send that in for publication um the, the, for some weird reason i maybe someone will explain to me the vocal side of it doesn't have dates so i can't tell it what order you're you know if you had a brass composition i'd be able to tell you what date your first composition was but um, I know you've got one, two, three, four, five pieces in the um, various journals, Sing to the Lord and Sing a New Song. I think you're very well known for I Have Seen the Glory of the Lord. Now, I, I knew of the piece and I hadn't heard it for a while before I knew who the composer was. And, I, you know, it, it sounded like one of these old um, Bill, uh, Phil Catlin, a Eric Ball pieces from the 1930s. Sing the glory of the Lord and wave the flag and let's do a glory it's not it's a relatively new piece um but is that the piece that sort of broke the ground for you or is that you know was there other pieces that kind of paved the way and said, hey this guy what else have you got in the cupboard chris because that's good so how did the publication journey start um yeah, so that's that's probably the, the biggest international one um the difficulty with australian ones is there's not a lot of people know that they exist <laughs> um the the first one that um, that I, I sent to uh, sent in was actually for, for the UK. It was Shine Lord, and uh, I think it was Volume Seventeen, the Things of the Lord. Yeah, and uh, the music secretary at the time, um, Graham Press, actually followed that up quite a few times for me because I'm thinking, I wonder if anyone's actually going to ever want to publish anything I did, at least in the army. And um, I think it took about five years to be published, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated by by the the, the lead time for, for it, but um uh for, for australia it was uh lord you gave me life and i think those were more that i'd already been using them with my with uh, my local core and uh we had the like the, the little brass section behind it to to give it some pep and with some bop along mm -hmm. and it was it was popular enough that we'd use it a couple of times and uh had a couple of people at the core who um who were from melbourne that said oh why, why don't you send it in for publication and i thought okay i can do that and um, I, was, I talked with Brian Hogg, and he was he was very um, very supportive of it. And um, uh, for for the three, I think in that series, um, yeah, they, he was he was keen to to see thought what was there and what else was available. And uh, and that goes back to the I don't always write for standard standard parameters. So no, it, was I, it was interesting to listen to him this afternoon. And it, I mean, I'm not a vi a big vocal fan anyway because it doesn't it's not my forte but i am happy to do it to learn and particularly with this series in interviews it's very important for me to get a taste of the musical direction and it almost struck me that you've got a very much kind of a a cross between len ballantyne and with a little bit of eric ball in your musical melody that you, you seem to be very happy to sort of you know some of those wonderful chords and harmonics and sort of firework colours that Len Ballantyne has in his music come out very easily in yours and it's almost kind of you can imagine the songs are almost clicking their fingers and arriving along and say hey this is a good Geordie piece but it's entering into the spirit of the occasion and I think that came very clear and I mean there was one that I cannot for the life of me remember what the opening lyric was and I thought it was so catchy and so brilliant I thought I'm gonna have to you know I mean you've got some more God is greater oh, and, yes. you know he has to be greater and it reminded me of a story um i can't remember the name of the commander there was a service normally officer who'd come from the philippines and they were doing a, a service in the uk and she said why is it that the western world compartmentalized god and we bring him down to the old man with the white beard you know sitting in church he said if in the philippines they have to have this massive god because they get tornadoes and typhoons and 
their, their house will be wiped out from one year to the next. And they literally have to pick themselves up. God has to be greater. God is bigger. God is stronger. And I think, you know, we, we seem to shy away from these wonderful terms. So it was interesting to see a term called God is greater. But yeah. you know, did, did the, the title for that sort of come naturally? Did it swing from the music or was it all, done, you know, kind of an embryonic thing from the actual writing of it? So that was that was an inter- interesting one. I'm I'm not sure if it ended up on the the, the written by, um, but that was a. Uh, I, I was fortunate to be the uh, vocal director for um, the Sydney Music Camp for eleven years, I think. And uh, every year we'd try to do something different. Um, and uh, one year we did uh, all the percussive sounds. If you've seen um, the Bedroom Jazz Hills Africa where they actually make rain noises and jump on the floor and clap mm-hmm. and everything. That's um, so I did that with Planet Shakers Rain Down and that, would, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, so I was always trying to look at something that would engage um, the kids at the camp. And um, that, uh, there was one year where it, um, there was quite a few kids that, uh, that really had a lot of uh, some, some positive energy in them about what they wanted to see in their life. And, um, and they also had a, a really, Good, good focus on where they could see uh, service of uh, the, the service for God being. And I thought, okay, well, let's chat about this. And I got a whiteboard out, and uh, we went through the group. I think there was, I think there was 30, 25 or something in the group, and uh, started saying, okay, well, what what do you see God as? What 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 do you see um, your calling as? I started writing them out, and uh, I think, okay, some of this is starting to fit together, and you can group themes and. Um, so what does this all say? Well, God is greater than the greatest of our troubles through the storm. He gently cradles us through the palm of his head. And they started doing the lyrics and we started writing this together. And um, by about day four in the camp, we'd finished the song. And that was one of the, that, that was the main piece we had for the, for the camp. And uh, I put, the, put the, the music to it. A couple of rather late nights as you do at music camp. But um, to, to be able to... Camp? <laughs> Oh, no, it's, it's an exercise of, of being able to stay awake for 168 hours. It's yeah, so absolutely. much fun. Yeah, I've never been to one, but, the, you know, for me, oh, really? people, no, never had the opportunity. They're, they're amazing places. You, you, you I, see. Yeah, I didn't, for some reason, my call never went, whether we didn't have the connections or we didn't have the people or the know how or the officers moved on. But um, for some reason, I can't think of anyone at the core that sort of went to music camp while they were at the core as a representative of Woodbridge Core, and that's not being dismissed as oh, yeah. the, the, the fine musicians. It's just, I don't think it ever happened. Not in my time, anyway. I mean, I've, mm. I'm involved with other Salvation Army bands, and they're frequently going off to music camp and territorial music school, and it's lovely to see them have the experience. And um, uh, Nate, my uh, co-drummer, or the main, he's the main drummer, I just help him out, uh, came back, he said, we played to the chief musician. And he said, it was archaic. He's trying to work that all out. It was wonderful fun. He really got their teeth into it. And, you know, it was just one of these old pieces that has been around for a long time. That you know, it's just interesting to see kids sort of get hold of it. It goes back to what you were saying about youth band and YP band and, you know, playing the old marches. And the, the, the bright kids coming up with their faces lit up. Oh, this is wonderful. It's like, yeah, it was written 60 years ago. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, um, so, yeah, you, you no age on craftsmanship. <laughs> the, the wonderful craftsmanship. So, um, are there any sort of particular genres that you feel comfortable writing for in a, a vocal sense, in a sort of a prayer song or meditation, or do you prefer the, the, the peppy kind of lollipop functional song that's going to sort of get used in the let's bring them back from the interval kind of thing? Um, do, do you have a particular favourite, or are you just happy to write what comes and what gets asked to come? I I don't normally settle on a particular style. Um, I I like to to try and explore areas that haven't been done yet. So um, I, I certainly do like delving into um, what would it sound like in this genre. Uh, pr- probably not as as, as good as um, Scott Bradley in Postmodern Jukebox, but um, exploring what you can unpack in a particular style. So if it is a prayer and meditation piece, um, I did a, a benediction once um, and uh, that was very much like your um, back of the musical salvationist 
uh, four part harmony uh, piece. And it's like, okay, how could how can I get the most out of this to be able to to make that that experience for the listener, uh, and also for the singer as well. Mm-hmm. Um, in in the same way, if there's um, uh, a whole series that um, uh, the 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 band might be doing on a Sunday of just slow meditative pieces, which are beautiful, but if you've got those for weeks and weeks on end, your songster piece can't be slow either. And you kind of run out of fast songs to pieces. So it's like, okay, there's something I can do to balance up the universe. So sometimes there's opportunity to be able to do it. But yeah, it's, it's more of a, I really think something could work here. And, uh, and then exploring it and going through all the peril of, no, that didn't work. But yeah. <laughs> and bearing in mind that you have an a enormous portfolio of music at your disposal, and that we, we have not, hopefully not seen the last of the publicated works of Chris Brindley. Um, is there a piece of music that you've done that comes back to haunt you and you kind of go, the eyes are, yes, I'm aware of that, you know, that the, gets the most comments about? Um, there's, I did have, um, yes, Jesus Loves Me has followed the uh, Melbourne staff songsters around a little bit. And I know it even got used at a wedding. So I thought, well, people must like it. <laughs> um, there's, uh, pro- the, I think the prayer is the one that was, was following me around the most because I, I'm not sure um, if, if I was ever supposed to actually be allowed to arrange that. So I live in constant paranoia that someone's going to find me out one day. But um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful when people send you recordings of, uh, of, of a piece because you just know that it's been able to mean something to them. Yeah. Um, and whether it was that piece or a, a couple of the others, it's like, why did you do that to it? But <laughs> as a composer, like once, once the dots are on the page, yeah, yeah. that's somebody else's yeah. piece. So it's like, okay, I thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, as you say, sometimes it's, uh, you know, I, there's a wonderful interview with Les Condon where he says, you know, you, you put the notes on the paper and you think, well, I suppose it's all right. I, you know, until it gets played out and people go, oh, do you know what? I really enjoyed that. That was really wonderful. And that just caught me at the right time. And that's, as a composer, particularly within the Salvation Army, what you're aiming for. Um, but bearing in mind that with the duplicity of email and photocopies, that music doesn't necessarily become the, the, the published form, um, and it leaks out via people. Oh, can I have a copy for my core band or my songs brigade? Um, have you ever sort of had a, a comment or an email from somewhere that you least expected it about a piece of your music being performed or played? Uh, the, that was probably the, the prayer. So that was uh, that was to go out to a couple of people, and uh, then it uh, it went out a little bit further. So um, it's yeah, you, you hear about uh, oh yeah, I was I'm from. Uh, North something where sure and uh, yes uh, we were playing that on the weekend it's like I've never heard of that call <laughs> but uh, yeah okay that's 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 very nice um, please stop doing that <laughs> um, I do try to be a little bit careful about it because um, I, I do uh, particularly an arrangement if, if I've arranged something and it's somebody else's piece and then it's gone out into the wild then um, well I'm kind of responsible in some way for that because it's not mine to give away. So, um, and I, when I was, when I was um, doing the music secretary role for Australian East and then you, you really do want to honor the, the, the rights that people have to their own work yep. um, because you put effort in and, and, it, and it means stuff. And um, I guess one, one of the points that I think you'd raised in, in some of the, the emails before is that we do this for free. Um, people also do it for paid, but you did it, so you got to kind of kind of try and honour that. So, uh, in in a significant majority of cases, people have been very kind in asking permission, and I always make sure that I that I ask permission before I go and do something. So yeah, yeah. so yeah, it is very interesting because uh, you know it's a very interesting world that essentially once it's out there, you can't kind of claw it back and say you know rip it up and say no, but you know it. Have you ever had pieces, you know, that um, that haven't worked at the time? And years later, you you, re- you know, you've asked, been asked for a completely different piece, and you find that works as part of it. You know, that that scrap of paper kind of melds into it and go. Do you know what? That was ten years ago. I put that in the drawer, and I discovered it, and 
I think that will work. Did you ever throw have, anything away or you're a hoarder? I, I, I have a very large uh, group of old Sibelius files that have been sitting around. Since <laughs> I had Sibelius 1. So, <laughs> um, Not so, knowing but, Sibelius from 1 to 15, I haven't got a clue. Um, so I got my first copy in 2000, so 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a long long catalogue, and there's a lot we'll, that will never see the light of day. Um, but uh, particularly around music camp time, because there's off there, that's that's a great incubator for new pieces uh, all around the world, and um, it's it's a difficult genre to choose from. Um, I think uh, Australian Eastern was probably some of the one of the most progressive um, in in musical tastes. And then you add the youth component to that, they'll, they'll get very bored very quickly. So you try to put up something that's in a published journal and they go, so, um, uh, so I, I did dig into um, uh, a piece that I think I'd, I'd started 15 years prior. Um, and it was a nineties pop thing based on uh, the, the uh, I think it was American group Boys to Men. Um, none of their pieces, but it was just in that genre. Mm -hmm. And um, it it worked, and the the kids liked it, and they were really really keen to 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 jump in that genre, even though it was probably the early twenty tens by then. Yeah. But um, see, yeah, being able to resurrect yeah. something can actually work. It's interesting what you say about the music camps and youth camps being a hotbed of innovatism and the embryo onyx state of music that you come from nothing at the beginning to having this weird and wonderful. Uh, sparky piece at the end that kids really love. How how difficult it is as a composer. So you know you've written this in that idiom, in that sort of bubble of time, and then you have to kind of calm it down to sort of make it more accessible for the, a core band or the salvo band or something. You know, how does the transition work for you? Um, if you're running something <laughs> at camp. Um, then it's it's often very rushed, um, and you'll have specific uh, specific campers in mind. Um, but yeah, there is there is cleanup to do after that. Um, I think that the value of of, of the music camp uh, incubator is that there's just so much energy around it. Mm. So um, if something doesn't work, they still kind of make it work anyway. But you you do take note of that, and when you formalise it into more of a core setting. Um, Adults are generally more conservative than than uh, than your average twenty uh, twenty or sixteen year old. Um, so you do need to check whether it works harmonically, whether the the, the lines work, um, whether the the syncopation isn't over too, too over the top. Um, syncopation fascinates me. Um, it's only been around for the last ninety years, so people it's, it, people are yeah. catching on to it. It's like uh, so yeah, the the whole modern pop thing. It's 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 kind of a, a function of you, you get used to the music you you were when you finished school. So like if, if you're 16 or 18 years old, that's kind of the music you like forever. Yep. And to go out of that, so that kind of shapes a little bit about the the, the, the core culture anyone, that you write for. If anyone looks at my iTunes playlist, they they're gonna have a headache. So <laughs> I, I I mean I, as I said earlier, I'm a massive fan of the Irish group The Cause because they were really coming out in the mid nineties, which was my teenage years. And you, you follow that with the, sort of the latter Kylie and you had Catatonia and just um, the beautiful South and just groups like that, Texas that just came out and done these wonderful harmonics. And I was really reminded by a couple of your pieces. I just thought, I wonder who's been listening to the same CDs that I was uh, <laughs> listening to because the, the harmonic structure is very much similar. Um, I think it's one thing is that when you're preparing music and do music, we have to remember that in this day and age, we've got recordings and Spotify and YouTube coming at us from all directions. And I mean, you, you, you kind of alluded to something I was reminded of in a documentary where you, you only have to go back to say your great grandparents, where the idea of a radio would have been new to them that outside of that they didn't have cassette players if you were lucky enough to have a a, a a gramophone or a radiogram other than that unless the local orchestra came to town or unless the the brass band or some visiting symphony orchestra came out you didn't hear live music there was no television 
you know, the radio was its infancy and you would have only heard, as you say, Tchaikovsky symphony. You wouldn't have heard, you know, I remember my parents saying in the mid 60s that the, the local radio station would get request after request for the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all they wanted to do, you know, the wheels on the bus go round and round because <laughs> it's the, the kiddies' favourite. So um, when, when you're sort of having to sit down and write and concentrate on doing the commissions and say, okay, I've got to do this for the, the, the town songsters, the, the, the Melbourne staff songs or the divisional youth band, do you have to sort of lock yourself away and just sort of switch off Spotify and YouTube and the radio so you know you're you're free of all these influences? What's the what's the embryonic process for you? Um, it's it's the hardest thing in the in the world is like I just write something for this group. So um, to to have um, some scope to work on to to have a this is the personality of the group, or this is what we're, this is the, the spiritual journey we've been going on lately. This is, this is the experience that we're trying to, to, to capture or, uh, and I don't really like event, uh, writing for an event, but this is what this event's about. And this is the, the, the basis of it. If there's that start of it, um, then yes, it's wonderful to sit in a quiet room and uh, or, or just uh, in, enjoy a, a long, hot shower and just muse away about what sort of things can, can be like that. Um, it, it often leads to the question of, um, oh, is it the words first or is it music first? And I was like, well, there's no, there's no rule to it. Um, but if there's a theme to work with, then you can kind of start unpacking what, what sort of energy there is in that. Um, if, if it's a, a commission one, then, then there's direction normally given. If it's, up, if it's just something for, the, for, for my own experience, um, a great way of, of dealing with stress is just to sit out and, and vandalize a piano for a while. Just get, get whatever it is <laughs> out. And, um, and sometimes that can be uh, two minutes and sometimes that can be half an hour. But um, the, 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 the beauty I have is I, I can play piano and I can play piano reasonably well, but I'm not a, a concert pianist. So I will make many mistakes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those mistakes work. And just in that process of unpacking whatever emotion I have at the time, then sometimes you can explore that. It's like, actually, I, look, I kind of like that. Yeah. And, um, and that how you feel at the time and usually what brought you to that state will start to unpack a story that you can tell in song, whether it be a, 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 a vocal piece or whether it be a piece from an instrumental ensemble. So, yeah, it's interesting where it leads. Yeah. Um, and I know that um, most of your published works are words and music um, by yourself. Uh, do you ever get people saying, you know, you know, like the Keith Banks will send some words and lyrics through and say, could you do a setting for it? You know, is that something you're, um, you're asked to do at any time? Um, occasionally, occasionally. Um, it's, I, I do get worried about disappointing people because they'll say, okay, well, Here's some words I've worked on for the last uh, last six years, and it's like, well, <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, I guess when I was starting to write in, in the whole uh, teenage years, I'd have um, some some people that would throw me some words, and I'd try and work with those, and it just didn't work. <laughs> so it's like, okay, have you considered the 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 the, the value of what a syllable is, like? Is, is one line that's got 43 syllables and the next line's got two. And like, there's no balance. It's like, so in some ways it was just easier for me to, to work with idea and, and sweat through the pain of writing lyrics, which I find much harder to do than write music um, because I, I try to over-design it. At, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I have worked with um, a couple of people over time and um, some of them have been really good. Uh, a lot of the, the lyric stuff ends up being um, contemporary worship pieces. Um, so we had a, a, a pop group in the 90s called Heart and Soul. And um, one of the, the van, vansmen, he's, uh, he ended up being a member of parliament, actually. But uh, he'd, he'd write some, some, um, uh, write some lyrics, I'd write a tune. Uh, we'd try and use that for worship on a Sunday the core would kind of frown at it and say, well, that was terrible. And mm -hmm. we'd go and fix it and we'd use it, use it somewhere else. And we went on a couple of trips around the countryside and, uh, and that seemed to work. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. But it, yeah, collaborations. 
as a lyricist, particularly within the Salvation Army worship, I mean, we look at some of the greats and their their technical knowledge is something that we could only dream of aspiring to in our own humble way. I don't speak as a composer. I just speak as someone who loves the lyrics and the music of the army, which is one of the main parts of doing these things. But I am aware that you, having spoken to people who have been in the editing process, that how do you try to make sure that you're theologically in keeping with the army traditions and the army beliefs? Because you can write scripture till the cows come home, but it's kind of, oh, that's not army. How, how do you sort of educate yourself to try and keep it, you know, harmoniously true to, you know, the beliefs and the structure of the Salvation Army? What one would hope that the army is scripturally based. Um, the, <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for um, the, the, the songbook. Uh, there's the, just just paying attention to the stuff that's there. Um, the, I, I remember really becoming conscious of it when the the, the new songbook came out in 1987. Um, no, the old songbook. Started... We've had a new one since then. Yeah, no, no. I was just, just I was so excited when these books came out from England because you know everything costs twice as much here and takes three <laughs> months to come out on the ship. Um, but uh, looking through each of the pieces, I'm thinking, okay, so oh, what's new in this one? Big songbook. Oh, see, it was it was. Well, it, we, we, we're, <laughs> so we're we're in time zone, and we've got the, the got the if delayed guess, shipping. So I it was the whole year 19, before we got that. I can do the nineteen. Oh, there we go. One. <laughs> okay, you're pushing me here. You're pushing me here. I'm the nineteen thirties one around somewhere. <laughs> you were saying the nineteen thirty one? That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> oh boy. If I really um, looked hard enough, I could actually find the 1897 edition. Oh my goodness. And my father used to collect them because he grew obviously I'm a fourth generation salvationist. And uh, yeah, yeah. we just used to collect all the song books. I mean, I was given that the other day. Oh wow. And I've just worked <laughs> my way through that and some of the songs in that just take yeah, you know, just take your breath away. And there's one about drugs. I thought, was this written this year or you know? Glory it's, in my soul. It's, it's the wonderful. same. It's the same army message. It's yeah. the same army message. Yeah, it's it doesn't change, and I think that's what's incredible. You talk about the somber, and I've got. To, I would like to ask the question: Do you have a? And I've got to be precise about this because I want I want the answer to be within the framework. A favorite song from the Salvation Army songbook, and then I'll split the question. Boundless says the mighty ocean in in that uh, the the 1986 songbook you've got there, number 230. Is uh, some beautiful imagery in there, and um, um, I, I I did actually it's un, unpublished, and I've only done the live performance of it. Yeah, fifth and all, guide me, great Jehovah. Mm-hmm. Which everyone keeps getting confused with, guide me, oh, they great Jehovah. It's completely different tune. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but okay. But outside of the confines of the army, do you have a a Christian song that uh, you really like? Not not just a maybe a Fanny Crosby or Charles Wesley. Not necessarily something in the army songbook. Is there a another one, maybe contemporary Christian that means a lot to you? Um, I think la- last year was um, for me personally. It was actually quite a difficult year. And um, there's a, a piece by uh, Elevation Worship called Do It Again. And um, that really was a piece that helped speak to, speak to me through the year that, um, that uh, he made a way that there was no way, then I believe he can do it again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the concept around that is that our God, I guess our God is greater than the, um, than the world around us and the situations that we have. And th- there's no limit to what he can do. And, He's done it before. He can do it again. He's he's beyond time. He's beyond space. He's um he's the creator, the Father, the Almighty. And um, who are we to to, to question who, who he is? Is uh, cool. he has the, the 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 plan of each of our lives mapped out, and we just need to be willing and obedient to hear it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's getting a little bit deep, but yeah, it, it does reflect the the value that you see. Um, part of the the main reason for Dean Jones getting me to do this crazy situation is because lockdown has forced many of us not to be able to venture past our own driveways or the local supermarket so obviously 
you know, practices, corporate worship, divisional territorial worship has all gone out for the time being. So has this meant that, you know, the readjusting of life means that composition and that ability to sit down has sort of gone down because other things have taken control and you've had to sort of rethink your life? Or has it given you the space to go, yep, I am going to finish that piece of music, I can do it. Which way has it gone for you? And what could we expect from the, the Brindley compositional bench? <laughs> uh, there, there is still stuff coming out, but uh, it's it slowed down a little bit. If, um, uh, I, I, actually, I work at, uh, at THQ and uh, in the project management team. And uh, we, like many, have um, seen uh, the, the, the budget downturn. So we've had a, a 60% but, uh, cut in budgets, but um, we still want to be able to produce things. And, and see the army progress in, in, in many areas. So that means um, that we've taken on, on additional responsibilities and, and we're, we're working extra at the moment. So um, that, and I'm on um, two projects at the moment I'm particularly passionate about. So um, once you've done your, your 60 or so hours of the week that you really shouldn't be doing, um, yeah, the, the weekends are, are, are getting tied up with uh, just being back with family and there's a little bit of time there still for music and um, mm -hmm. and enjoying that. And there's some, some good pieces to be able to be written. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the, I think I said, I was, I was running, I'm working on a piece with Rob Little at the moment. And, um, and that's, that's what I'm looking forward to getting some traction on. Um, I'd had a, a request from um, uh, New York staff band to do an arrangement. I was in the glory of the Lord for them because they were going to do it at um, commissioning this year. Mm -hmm. um, but that's obviously going to be, or it was a virtual event that was going to happen about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately that, that um, it doesn't get a live performance this year, but uh, there's that. And uh, there's a couple of others that have been uh, kicking around in, in the background, but uh, yeah, just, it's such a crazy time to be able to, to work in headspace uh, because of all the, the, up, yeah. uh, the, oddities that are happening at the moment to be able to, to have something come to write. It's, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge. So, so what else takes your time up? What are your other hobbies? What, you know, when you don't have to, when, when the music's not clicking and melding and you need to sort of let the brain rest and do something completely different. Are you a walker, walking the dogs, painter, hiker, fisherman? What, what are the other hobbies and passions in your life? Yeah, I, I do you walk for walks. Up to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do go for walks. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a state forest uh, nearby, and I'll I'll do a lap around that. It's about about five kilometres, um, or uh, uh, even just walking to to the shops on the other side of the suburb is uh, is a, a three kilometre uh, walk. Um, I, I did uh, have this this big uh, dream one day, thinking, okay, well, what if I walk to sit walk, walk to the city? And uh, I'm about uh, 13 kilometres away from, from Brisbane City. So I thought, okay, well, let's do that. <laughs> and that was a very nice Saturday. So, um, yeah, I, I, I took the plunge and, and decided to do that. But um, um, of late, particularly while I've, while I've been inside, um, I, my wife's a school teacher, so she's been able to go back to school and teach, uh, teach mm -hmm. remotely from school. And um, even when... My, when my daughters have been at school, I've still been at home. This is, this is week 14 for me at home. Mm -hmm. And I've had maybe four days out. Um, so uh, apart from walking around the suburb, um, I'll uh, often get up in the morning and do some rowing on the rowing machine. And uh, that'll be 20 minutes of torture, but uh, it'll be something I'll look back on and think, yeah, I'm glad I did that. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I'm glad I did it. So... Yeah, they're, they're probably the, the things I'll do to, to get the brain, brain working and functioning again. <laughs> um, bearing in mind that many of things come from scripture, uh, script, favourite passage of scripture or scripture verse, as of, you know, when you woke up this morning, because it could change every other day, depending on your mood. But is there yeah, something yeah. from the fridge magnet that um, you th there's, there's actually a couple. There's a couple that I, I, I tried to, as a teenager, you know, you think, I'll just go and memorise a whole Bible. Um, because you hear of the whole whole uh, uh, Jewish approach of, of memorizing the Torah and the value that it holds, and it really does help when it sticks in your brain. Mm. Um, and I'll, I will certainly admit that to that being an incomplete task. But um, there's a couple that have that stuck with me, and um, uh, for for the no, for I know the, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to not harm you, is is one that, um, that constantly comes up at, at the temple at, uh, at, at Brisbane. 
Um, but there's, there's other ones which I went to the trouble of trying to memorize uh, further. So um, uh, the whole Hebrews 11 um, by faith uh, uh, and each of the, the characters that, that in the Bible that have been mentioned through that. Um, and uh, the time honored favorite, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the love chapter. Um, and if, if I'm not in a pinch like I am at the moment, I can recite the entire thing word by word. And every now and again, something will stick in your mind and mm. you think, okay, I'm glad I remembered that. I'm glad I was able to draw, back, draw down from that. Um, and um, I've had, over the years, there's been medical operations where you always get worried about going under anesthetic and thinking, will you come out again? And uh, <laughs> oh, the, we've been there, done that. The time and true, Psalm 23, um, uh, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear not evil. Um, but the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he leads me beside still waters and that calming thing. So there's a couple to draw on, but it's, it's absolutely worth getting to a point that at some, at some time in your life that you can sit with scripture and have it really speak to the, 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 the deep, uh, deeper most as a lyricist um, part of your soul and to be able to dwell on it and to have, have a, have true meaning. And that's, that's something that, yeah, it really, it really helps both in the trivial inspiration, but also in, in times where you really need it. Yeah, I think that's one of the beautiful things about scripture is that it may not sometimes seem like there's a verse that, you know, you go to a how long was that just printed for me? And you, you're sort of testing the, the ink out to make sure it's dry. I, you know, I, I've said before that I had several occasions in my life where I always have to Google the verses because I can never remember. I think they're one... Thessalonians chapter 5 and that's my mantra is you know uh, pray continually be joyful but test everything against the Holy Spirit and mm. you know there's almost like a series of sermons there that you know praying continually doesn't mean and I learned this one the hard way sitting down with my head buried all the time you can pray when you're talking to the Lord when you're walking through the park and a friend of mine who I who will remain nameless, he knows who he is, who persuaded me to listen to a tone poem by Kenneth Downey rather than just listening to the Eric Ball marches, opened up the whole new prospect of variational work and sort of the, the torchbearers' songs and the, those wonderful um, Calvary tracks and My Life Must Be Christ Broken Bread rather than, you know, you know, and just listening to that two, three minute sound bars. I can't listen to something 10 minutes long, I'll be asleep. And he said, no, but you're talking to the Lord and that's prayer and always be joyful. And I think that that comes through scripture, doesn't it? That, you know, we don't have to be down and our life can really kick us in the teeth sometimes, but the scripture is there to empower us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot, lot of the have, world yeah. is, 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 is in that space as well, because you're looking at Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And um, to be able to, to look at, at Dean Hoffman's pieces like that and to take that time to, to soak in pieces and be able to, to, to go on that journey that they've also gone on is, is really exciting. Now, I don't know about you. I think we've, we've got better at it in the UK, but I have actually, they will remain nameless. One of them, I can't even remember who it was, but we did have, I have sat in Saturday Family Band concerts where they are played The Light of the World and they get the words wrong and i always want to go are they going to say the right words because it's oh jesus thou art standing outside the heart's closed door oh will you hear him enter knock knocking evermore that's what the symbol of the light of the world is how's how dean goffin wrote the piece you know oh thou art standing and, oh jesus i have promised to serve thee to the end and i'm yeah, do you have you read the score notes? I mean, the whole thing is about <laughs> Jesus knocking at the heart of the door, going, "Will you let me in?" I mean, the whole I, I do love the life of the world because it's got that evocative don 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 right at the beginning. I mean, it's like that other. I think it's um, Dean Goffin's Road to Emmaus, where you've got that musical mm. dom bom bom, the, the actual plodding along the road. You the know, imagery in, in music is, is so exciting, both as a composer and as a conductor. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, he's I, just I, across, the, across the ditch for us. He's Kiwi. Yeah, but I've been dead since 1983, unfortunately. So I never... Mm. Um, I, <laughs> I said to a lot of people, uh, 
I envy the the fact that Les Condon's name has been mentioned um, many, many times. And I was only about four or five years old when he passed away. So I never got the chance to meet him. But his legend, his name to be mentioned in the same breath as Eric Ball, Ray Stedman Allen and Ken Downey. I think to composers, I think it's just gold dust because I would not have expected his name to be included. And that's not to the detriment of Les or Michael Kenyon or, you know, Barry Gott mm. or any of the contemporary, but the, the Broughtons or the Himeses or the Kernos who have just blessed us continually. Um, just quickly before I pray with you, um, who are your favourite composers? The people with whom you, not necessarily the people that you've mentioned, people like Len Ballantyne, who've encouraged you and have sort of, you know, given you the idea for harmonics, but just leaves you to sit down and enjoy. Who, who are the composers and musicians in the army? The, they're not, mainly they're no longer with us, no longer writing, but are there any names that sort of say, I really enjoy their music, blah, 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 blah. I, I was very fortunate at, uh, uh, I think the Symphony Sounds about three years ago, um, I was able to meet a, a couple of a couple of people in the UK, and uh, was very fortunate. Dorothy Neskevel said, "And this is Ken Downey." Oh, and I just had that moment, this oh. fanboy moment. It's like, "Hello." Yeah. He <laughs> said, so, "Do you do you know do you know of him?" It's like, "Yes, I do." <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm you're talking you about, oh, and you talk about the master of harmony, the this there, yeah, right there, right there. Um, so yeah, there there are some absolute treasures in the army, and um, he's certainly one of them. And to to meet him and and a couple of other fine people that um, from from the music department, also through just from around the UK, um, mm. and even some Americans. We will we'll mention those. Um, that um, the mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, it's 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 wonderful that that people have taken the time to to put their craftsmanship into the army world and to be able to discover the beauty that can be, that can be uh, given in music to be able to, to honor God and, and, and the, um, the, the work that he's given us to do. I, I, you, you reminded me of the first time I ever met Ken Downey. My, a friend of mine was at the time the bandmaster of the court stone market and they were doing a weekend. I think he knew Ken fairly well. And I, he emailed me, he said, we're going to have a weekend he'll be there for the Saturday night, come over, you know, and enjoy it. And I walked in and he was off in a, a side room and said, yeah, well, if you stay around afterwards, I'll introduce you. I thought, Thanks, you know, and it's, it's sort of tiny, Jim, he's not a very tall guy, walked in and done a wonderful concert. And afterwards I, I sort of rushed up and I'm like, ah, and this is my good friend Morven from Woolwich. He said, ah, Morven, I've heard of you. Your name is familiar. What, I'm not a composer. <laughs> I've never written a word. How, what have I done wrong now? Um, and he said, oh, it's, it's lovely to meet you. And I, I said, make Jesus king. You're wonderful. Where does that chorus come from? I've been dying to know. Said, oh, it's an old singing company chorus I wrote years ago. That's why I can't find it. And he just sort of <laughs> filled in the words for me. I was like, thank you. That can be, you know, I can rest my brain now. I now know the source of this wonderful march. But he was so lovely about it. It, you know, it was a real pleasure to meet him. And Actually, five years ago, I was queuing up at the O2 for one of the Boundless concerts, and he was three people ahead of us in the queue. And we just kind of <laughs> murmured. I was like, what's his... He got... Dad, do you do realize Ken Downey's <laughs> three people? Is he? Oh. So he's a, he really is a lovely guy. And um, an old Chicago staff bandman once said to me, uh, something that I have held very dear to my heart, is that if you ever meet a composer or an arranger that you have been blessed by tell them because sometimes that will just be the, the thing they need to hear and i i had the great pleasure of meeting rosemary stebbin allen when she came to woodbridge oh, yeah. and the mission had just her father's piece i said i love that it really spoke to me she said oh he'd be so pleased because everyone thinks of the lord is king and you know all these magnificent wonderful pieces and it's the little peppy ones that get forgotten i said you know it's only about three minutes long but it really blessed me so th this is an attempt to say chris brindley thank you for your music sounds a bit like abba here thank you for all the music <laughs> um but i am going to do i'm going to end this incredible time that we've had together in the only way i feel proper and that is to offer it up in prayer 
as you wish, dance around the room, sit on your hands, whatever comes comfortable to you as scripture says. Um, dear Lord, the beauty of music is just something that is biblical. And I thank you for Chris's ability to breathe life into the written word, that people are continually blessed by the fact that from a very early age, you blessed him with the understanding of music, of notes, of composition, of arranging, of putting them on a page that people can understand. I thank you for his upbringing, that you were there, that you've inspired him, that you are at the very center of his life and that when he's doing his composition and writing and just doodling on the piano and trying to stretch that idea from his brain to the written page, doesn't always go straight forward but he knows that you're at the center of the Lord he knows that you're there helping him we thank you for the mentors the Barry Dots the Brian Hoggs all these wonderful names that just seem to be legends in the Salvation Army and in their own way they were the people who had to start as well they had to learn their way as well and that we can learn so much from them and just from their spirituality and I thank you for Chris's spirituality of his willingness to follow you for his willingness to stand up and be counted. And not just in the saying and the doing, with the, the, the music camps and the youth, um, with his roles at THQ, with the, the, the songs to brigades and the brass ensembles, uh, with his family and friends, Lord. I pray for him now, Lord. This 2020 is proving to be a, a really curious year and will not be looked on with much affection, but in the midst of the trouble and the strife, you are there and you are just waiting for us to come back to you and ask for your strength and your guidance which you give to god be the glory when we have exhausted you've just begun giving we thank you lord for that chris can rely on the strength the encouragement the devotion and just that wonderful sense of jesus being in his life and just guiding him empowering him and just when the music fades and all is stripped away and it's not working that you say walk away and you will provide the answer lord and it will be done and he will recognize that and he will accept that and he will know that in the end of the day lord that will be the blessing that will be the most that that peace will just go out and inspire and bless people which is why we play the music which is why we have wonderful composers like chris who are willing to put pen to paper to put that note down to hammer that piano chord until it sounds right and sounds decent and sounds logical and happy and contented and we just thank you Lord, for the ability to be able to talk from knowing nothing about zoom and thinking it's just something that happened on a video camera to zoom in on someone to be able to have this really in-depth conversation about the nuts and bolts and mechanics with people on the other side of the world lord i thank you lord for his time his willingness to be involved in it and just his christianity that comes out so much thank you lord, for all that you've done all that you are doing and all that you will continue to do in his life and i just pray a blessing and the strength and the peace and the security of jesus christ on his family and friends right now in jesus name i pray amen Thank you, Melvin.